Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark O'Malley here with the Hurricane Outlook and Discussion for May 15th, 2022, recorded on 4.10 p.m. Eastern Time. We have a lot to talk about today, including the potential for a tropical system to be forming in the Caribbean over the next five to six days, and a look at what to expect for the upcoming 2022 Atlantic hurricane season. Taking a wide look across the tropical Atlantic this afternoon, not much is occurring yet. We are watching a tropical wave that to me seems like it is near the Lesser Antilles at the moment. Of course, this tropical wave originated off the coast of Africa during the last several days and has now traversed the entire basin. And with this being said, this will likely now end up in the Caribbean over the next several days and could be the catalyst for tropical cyclone genesis along with a central american gyre uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute that could uh, form uh, around central america and contribute to enhanced rainfall maybe the potential for a tropical storm we'll talk about that here in a minute looking at the sea surface temperature anomaly map updated as of yesterday we're still very persistent within a la nina right now and taking a look you know, out there, so to speak, across the Nino 3-4 index. Again, this is the area that we use for determining El Nino or La Nina conditions. And we are firmly entrenched within a La Nina pattern. In fact, uh, some of these anomalies here are getting up to about uh, minus one half to two degrees Celsius below the long-term average. And <clears throat> we talked about this really in the beginning uh, of, you know, last month and months prior we had an anomalous area of warmth uh, right here closer to the coast of South America, which has now almost entirely gone away. And we've switched that to pretty strong negative anomalies, cooler anomalies on the order of about two and a half to three, three and a half degrees Celsius below the long term average. That's very important because that that would reduce any stability problems in the Caribbean because again, upward moving air, wherever you have a concentration of warmer anomalies, that's typically associated with upward moving air, especially a large area. And I mean, this is several hundred you know, miles. This isn't something that you know is very small. And so this could have created some stability issues in the Caribbean. And that seems to all be reduced at this point. And some of the shear indices that are coming off the composite parameters um, suggest that we could be dealing with a pretty active Caribbean season, given that we have lower shear in the Caribbean, um, even compared to normal. And generally speaking, we could have some of the precip anomalies are suggesting a wetter Caribbean, which would go to suggest maybe more activity in that part of the basin. But looking across into the Atlantic side, again, the Atlantic is pretty much ready to go at this point. Um, still a few areas that are below the long-term average um, or just slightly at or below that average. Um, but most of the Atlantic at this point is, is ready to go um, for you know what will be seemingly a busy hurricane season. And of course, the Caribbean and Gulf of Mexico. Of course, the Gulf of Mexico is very warm. It's always warm, though, to support intense hurricanes. That's certainly, you know, no question about it. And another product to really kind of give us a, a grasp on where we're at right now is the upper ocean heat content. It's been a long time since we visited this map. Um, but, you know, because now we've got something that could be taking advantage of that, it's time to talk about it. And so what upper ocean heat content is, is it's basically a measure of the depth of the warm water. And this is in kilojoules per centimeter. And this is just basically suggesting that, again, anywhere within these lighter shades of blue, and then, you know, you get into the green, yellows, and reds here, this all towards the right side of the scale is indicating high upper ocean heat content and more warm water uh, at depth because again we're not just focused at the water surface we're also focused about the depth of that warm water and so the more you know warmer colors you get on this map here suggest high upper ocean heat content and higher available potential energy for a tropical system to work with in. And we notice that what we're dealing with in the Caribbean, especially near the island of Jamaica, Cancun, and uh, this little uh, loop eddy right now in the Gulf of Mexico suggests that we have some pretty high upper ocean heat content, at least enough for a tropical system to take mild advantage of. This is certainly nothing 
that is exceptionally high at this point. It's not these, you know, oranges and reds here like we typically see later in the season. But after all, this is May 15th and not August 15th. So it is important to kind of just keep that in mind. But anything that forms down here in this region, at least in the thermodynamic environment, would have the correct sea surface temperature profile and uh, upper ocean heat content depth to certainly take advantage of that. And we can also look at this in a different realm. This is the actual sea surface temperatures at, at uh, the surface of the water here. And again, we zoom in here, we notice that water temperatures across most of the Caribbean, especially the Western Caribbean, are right around about 28 degrees Celsius. And we notice that even off here into the Eastern Pacific, we have water temperatures near 30 Celsius. But again, these water temperatures, 28, you know, 27, 28, you know, 29 Celsius, those are definitely well supportive for tropical systems. And I mean, even all, all the way to the coast of Florida here, we have water temperatures that are about 26 Celsius. And, you know, that's still, you know, marginally favorable for tropical cyclones, um, at least to maintain themselves uh, within said thermodynamic environment. So the profile right now seems to suggest that at least based on the sea surface temperature profile, we could theoretically handle and support a storm, especially down there in the Caribbean, as we would generally expect. So what's all this buzz about? Well, this is the GFS operational forecast, the 12Z run. This is valid as of 2 p.m. this afternoon. So we'll move this out forward. Now this is valid for 8 p.m. this evening, 0Z. And just a kind of a few players right now. So this is at 850 millibars. So this is at about 5,000 feet above ground level. And we're looking at cyclonic vorticity, which is shaded in the oranges and, and reds and yellows here. And so again, this is really kind of the area that we're going to be watching over the next several days here. And one of the key players in this will jump up to 500 millibars here. And we have the subtropical ridge that's extending out here, but we do have a weakness right now. There's a little bit of a, a shortwave trough here. And this is going to be exiting the picture within the next several days. So if we move this out forward in time, we notice that again, this moves out. And by hour 54, this is by about 18Z or 2 p.m. Tuesday, we have this subtropical ridge beginning to build in over top here of the Caribbean. Now at the same time, again, we'll go back to the 50 millibar vorticity. This is the area that you want to watch right here. This little area of vorticity that you'll see just kind of consolidate and congeal in this area. And eventually this little bit of vorticity begins to spin up right now near the coast of Central America. And this has been pushing ever so slightly westward with time. Now the ensembles on the GFS ensembles here, again, we notice that there is still a weak area of vorticity down here. And in fact, we notice that if we go to the ensemble mean sea level pressure, there's a clustering of areas, the, all these little red numbers in here, this indicates low pressure. So whether this is a closed low, whether this is a tropical depression, storm, whatever, we don't know the answer to that. And quite frankly, nobody does. Um, but we also notice that there's going to be this subtropical ridge out here. And if we jump up again to the 500 millibar height anomalies, uh, we notice that we have a considerable amount of ridging that is the subtropical ridge here. And the subtropical ridge, again, around this ridge, it's an anticyclonic flow or clockwise flow. And so the general flow would be one that pushes this into Central America and doesn't allow for something to just sneak its way northward. And I think the models have been trending that way with time. And we can kind of take a look at that where we notice that the trends have been definitely one that continues to support uh, there to be an expansion of this subtropical ridge and also more of that westernly component from, from east to west basically shoving this into Central America. And most of the other models are in agreement with that at this point. So again, looking at the GFS operational, this manages to end up getting ourselves a tropical cyclone here by about Saturday. By about this Saturday, we have in the model what appears to be a tropical cyclone uh, at this point. 
The other problem though with this is not just the steering, it also has to do with vertical shear. We have an approaching, we have the subtropical jet down here that is just blasting with over 30 to 40 knots of vertical shear. And while that's initially helping to kind of evacuate air on the northern side of, of this, we also have a storm that would be displaced compared to where the center of this upper level anticyclone is. And so we eventually have a storm that forms well within the shear region and the center of this upper level anticyclone is located over here. So this would be imparting a little bit of shear into the storm already. And if we look at the relative humidity, we also notice that because again, this is a cyclonic uh, storm, uh, that we would have this counterclockwise flow and this means dry air getting entrained into our storm. So anything that does form, it's not improbable, but anything that does form seems like it would be on the weaker end. Now, we all know what happens if you've looked out far enough on the GFS forecast. We know what happens after that. We know where it goes. We know how strong it gets. But I think it's kind of irresponsible at this point to be showing that because we just don't have the answers. And I don't think we're going to have the answers for a little bit of time yet, especially because if we look here at the European ensembles, this is our 120 and this is 144, 168. This is our 168 on the GFS. This is our 168 on the European ensembles and there's absolutely nothing. So this goes to show that there doesn't really seem to be any other model support other than the GFS, the ensemble version of the GFS, and uh, the other ensemble, the GEPS, which, you know, again, they all have their model biases. And one of the biases here of the GFS is that it tends to underdo the subtropical ridge and has a tendency for storms to be lifted in a poleward direction, meaning they are lifted northward quicker than reality should. And this is, you know, again, I mean, a weak storm isn't necessarily just going to start lifting northward. Again, it kind of been the old trend that, you know, a weaker system goes further west and a stronger system goes further north. So this all kind of lends credence to what the European ensembles are showing, at least through our 168, etc. So I'm not really too enthused about this. Uh, at this point, I don't see there being a significant reason uh, to be worried about this. Certainly, I mean, it's a good reminder, though, that we are approaching hurricane season. And again, Atlantic Basin side runs through from June 1st through November 30th. Now, moving on to the severe weather side of things, we have a couple of risks for severe weather over the next several days, an enhanced risk today across portions of the mid Midwest and Arklatex region. We also have an enhanced risk tomorrow across portions of the Northeast, including a tornado threat with some wind and hail probabilities, a slight risk on day three across portions of the upper Midwest. And then on days four or on days five and six, we have a big risk for severe weather across most of the upper Midwest and Midwest regions and Great Lakes. So that is going to wrap up that. One other quick thing. So we are doing this hurricane safety and preparedness e-course, and that will be available for just $10 on Skillshare and on Etsy. Links will be down in the description down below for both of them, and you can go check them out. Uh, the videos itself in the courses uh, will begin officially as of tomorrow. We are finishing up the final preparations to launch this, making sure everything is nice and professional, of course, on that end, so you get what you pay for, basically. So, uh, with that being said, those will be available tomorrow in the afternoon, sometime around by 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And again, links for those will be down in the description below. And of course, I'll be making posts about it on my Twitter and on the YouTube community section once those are live. All right. With that being said, I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon and evening. Of course, I am Mike Romali. I'll talk to you guys again some more tomorrow.